You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 18th of January. Sham marriage gang on trial in Sheffield. Boy 13 who raped a woman gets just three years. Kitchen worker jailed for alleyway attack in Newmarket. Car giant Renault to cut 7,500 jobs in France. Germany is bringing gold reserves home. Nick Griffin, MEP from the belly of the beast. A mother and her seven children have been jailed for 15 years in Egypt for converting back to Christianity. Islamists destroy pre-Islamic treasures in the Maldives. Thought for the day, a humble triad economics. And finally, feline like a stowaway. UK News. Sham marriage gang on trial in Sheffield. Talib Hussein, an immigrant, paid for Eastern European women to fly to Pakistan and pose as the wives of Pakistani men in series of sham marriages. The men then applied to live in the UK under EU border laws which allow the spouse of EU citizens to live and work in the United Kingdom. Talib Hussein, who has five children himself, all living off the taxpayer, for their education and welfare, is in the dock as his trial continues. Hussein, his wife and seven other members of his gang appeared in Sheffield Crown Court Thursday. They'll be sentenced for various immigration offences. Uncertainty surrounds fate of British hostages at Algerian gas field. Around 20 British hostages remain unaccounted for in the Algerian army's standoff with Islamic terrorists at the Aminas gas field in Algeria. We will, of course, keep you updated. Newmarket, a kitchen worker jailed for alleyway attack. A kitchen worker who tripped a young woman to the ground as she walked home alone along a town centre alleyway in the early hours of the morning and tried to sexually assault her, has been jailed for 14 months. Jakir Hussein grabbed hold of the terrified woman's arms during the attack, which happened near a graveyard, and tried to pull down her trousers, Ipswich Crown Court heard. She later told police she thought she was going to be killed and had suffered nightmares since the attack in August last year. Hussein, 27, of Barham Close Newmarket, admitted committing battery with intent to commit a sexual offence and was jailed for 14 months, and ordered to sign the sex offenders register for 10 years. A World Day spokesman said, 14 months is bloody pathetic. A boy of 13 who overpowered a woman then raped her in front of his two friends will spend just three years locked away for his crimes. Balal Khan, thought to be one of the youngest convicted rapists in Britain, targeted the 20-year-old as she walked home. He subjected her to a severe beating and then screamed at her, do what I say or I'll kill you, before putting her through the ordeal of a terrifying sex attack. He then stole her bag and phone and even took a call from his victim's boyfriend, to whom he bragged about what he had just done. But after pleading guilty to charges of rape and robbery, the teenager was sentenced to just three years because of his age, and also because he said he was sorry. European News Car giant Renault to cut 7,500 jobs in France there was more bad news for France's ailing car industry on Tuesday when Renault announced it would be slashing its staff members by 7,500 by 2016. The company will shed 5,700 jobs through natural attrition, with the balance coming from the extension of an early retirement programme subject to agreement with unions, a spokesperson said. Renault insists that it has no plans to make any staff redundant as part of the cutbacks. Germany is bringing gold reserves home. With much of its gold reserves deposited abroad, Germany has long depended on foreign countries to secure its precious metals. Now Berlin is moving some of its reserves from New York and Paris back home to Frankfurt. Germany's gold reserves are massive, second only to those of the United States in their quantity. They total some 3,400 tonnes, much of it acquired during the so-called economic miracle when Germany was rebuilding after the Second World War. Around a third of the country's reserves are in Frankfurt, while the rest is deposited in France, Great Britain and the United States. But the German Central Bank, under pressure from the public, wants to start bringing much of those reserves back home. A World State spokesperson said, We don't have the same problem as Brown sold all ours to Germany. (laughs) 
I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, who will be talking today on his response to the IRA Sinn Féin attack on the British National Party and also Pretty Girls in Boots. The EU beast was in its Strasbourg lair this week and I was there to keep an eye on it for you as usual. A bit of snow on the ground had the welcome effect of bringing a lot of the female assistants to work in a fetching variety of boots and tight trousers. It's times like that when you get an insight into just how many of the male assistants are on the other bus. Stunning girls catwalk through the corridors past little groups of young men who out in real world would fall silent with dropped jaws. In Parliament they don't even notice. They just carry on simpering about composite amendments to the regulations on the labelling of orange juice or more likely their weekend shopping plans. Still, I suppose it's great for the lads who are straight. One female who certainly doesn't turn heads is the hard-faced IRA member Martina Anderson. Sinn Féin's Northern Ireland MEP served 13 years in prison after being caught as part of the IRA's mainland bombing campaign. As such she was, and remains, a close comrade to the cowardly vermin who brought murder and mayhem to London and Birmingham and slaughtered and maimed children in Warrington and with the M62 coach bomb. None of which stop this Marxist arch-hypocrite from standing up this week in the parliamentary chamber and attacking the British National Party because some of our activists in Northern Ireland have rightly been involved in their community's protests at the decision to restrict the flying of the Union flag over Belfast City Hall. This woman, who played an active role in the bloodiest terrorist bombing campaign on the streets of England, that is, until her Islamist allies got in on the act, actually had the nerve to complain about some of the protests being illegal. She went on without a shred of evidence to accuse the BNP of orchestrating the violence. Unfortunately, Anderson made her allegations during the late evening free-for-all session, when a limited number of MEPs get 60 seconds each to raise any issue they want. Not knowing she would do so, I wasn't there to pull her up. This can be done under the blue card procedure, in which an MEP waves a blue card during the speech of another, who is asked on finishing if they're willing to accept the question. If so, both then get a minute to say their piece. Instead, I recorded a short piece the following day at the Parliament's TV recording studio. In that, I also noted similarly criticism this week by IRA Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness. Northern Ireland's Deputy First Minister, McGuinness claims he didn't kill or shoot anyone while on active service with the IRA murder gang from 1970 to 74. If true, and he would say that, wouldn't he, it suggests strongly that he spent his time either in the IRA's Celtic Network embroidery team or as the IRA's Londonderry commander ordering naive young boys to go and kill people. Frankly, one could have more respect for a man who went out and got blood and brains on his own hands rather than a coward who sent others to do the dirty work. In either event, a man who got the plum job of education minister as his personal payoff in a sordid bribe to stop his comrades blowing people to pieces really isn't in any position to criticise others because some bottles and fireworks have been thrown at demonstrations that got out of hand. In my video, I concentrate on the real issues and especially on the injustices done by the utterly one-sided peace process to the British community in Northern Ireland. Identifying the roots of the loyalists' desperation and pressing for sensible and fair measures to right the wrongs is far more likely to defuse the situation and lead to a genuine and permanent peace than knee-jerk or hypocritical condemnations of the actions of decent people at the end of their tether. I hope you'll watch this video and also pass on links to it to anyone you know with a family or sentimental connection to British Ulster. It's an unfortunate fact that IRA Sinn Féin are even better at spin and deceit than the average government minister, so our brothers and sisters over there need to see that their case can be put far more effectively than by the useless unionist establishment surrender monkeys like Peter Robinson. My own speech in Parliament this week is also on video. I got my 60 second ration during a debate on a report on closer connections between the EU and Iraq. Actually, I thought we already had that, because when I passed through Doncaster recently, it seemed that most of Iraq has moved there. The rest, I know from direct personal experience, are now in Wrexham. The report itself was an all too predictably depressing record of the horrors unleashed by the illegal Bush-Blair EU war. 
I won't repeat what I said because you can see for yourself on my MEP website and on our main website. It wasn't a great speech. I was shivering with some sort of Euro fever. The first time I'd been ill while over there in nearly four years. So I felt ghastly. Jackie, of course, made unsympathetic comments about man flu when I called her that evening to tell her I'd taken to my hotel room bed. Still, I did put over the alternative non-establishment view that I'm there to give. I hope you'll take the literal one minute to watch it. So all I'll add is that one of the concerns of the globalist MEPs is the brutal oppression of women and girls in the new Islamized Iraq. From being shut out of jobs right through to the return of female genital mutilation, their experience of post-war Iraq is a deeply unhappy one. It wasn't like that before the Eurocrats threw their rhetoric behind the weight of British armour, money and blood in Blair's war for oil and for the Labour Party's Zionist financiers. Saddam Hussein's government, while not perfect, lifted the women of Iraq a long way out of the medieval Islamism and chattel status that had been their lot for centuries. My late father-in-law, Reg Cook, was a highly qualified scientist who worked on international sales for the once great Northwest company, Pilkingtons. He did a lot of export business in Iraq in the years after its war with Iran. In those days, of course, the Americans and their Westminster puppets regarded Saddam as our bastard and sold him all the arms he needed to fight the larger forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran to a bloody standstill on First World War proportions. The combination of the deaths of so many young men with the drive to educate girls and allow women to climb the employment ladder meant, Reg told me once, that the majority of the Iraqis he dealt with, highly qualified scientists and top negotiators alike, were women. 179 futile British deaths and £10 billion and still rising later, those women and their daughters are now back beneath burkas and struggling to cook the evening meal despite the frequent collapse of the electricity supply. Never mind, it made Halliburton over $17 billion between 2003 and six alone, which will have made the likes of George Bush, Dick Cheney, Frank Gaffney and the other neocon crooks very happy indeed. Incidentally, we had a vote this week on the establishment of a tribunal for Iraqi war criminals. Naturally, I voted to see Tony Blair dragged in handcuffs to The Hague, and, but I was... <coughs> Incidentally, we had a vote this week on the establishment of a tribunal for Iraqi war criminals. Naturally, I voted to see Tony Blair dragged in handcuffs to The Hague, but to their shame, only one other British MEP did so. Meanwhile, the disasters caused by the political elites meddling abroad and social engineering at home continue to pile up, like the corpses in the morgues in the ruins of Iraq. They and their Wahhabi allies in the Gulf oil states have plunged Syria into civil war. Their banksters' crisis is entering a new and dangerous phase with race to the bottom devaluations by the major currency blocks. Desperate Greek families are putting their children into orphanages rather than see them slowly starve to death. Teenagers attending parties in Greece now take bottles of heating oil rather than wine. The BBC, of course, prefer to concentrate on the plight of the gangs of criminal illegal immigrants now that Greek nationalists are organising community defence teams to make up for the absence of the virtually bankrupt police and protect innocent people and their property from a tidal wave of imported third world criminality. And here in Britain, it's just starting to sink in that our own overburdened social services and benefits budget face further hammer blows at the end of the year when the temporary restrictions on immigration from Bulgaria and Romania expire. As has already been widely reported in the tabloid press, government ministers won't even tell us how many extra sponges and cheap labour competitors they're expecting this to dump on already deprived parts of Britain. Migration Watch have estimated 300,000, which is an awful lot of houses dull queues, higher taxes, beggars and criminals. Despite the media coverage focusing on the coming arrival of hundreds of thousands of Roma gypsies, there is an additional factor that will make this a disaster for Bulgaria and Romania as well as Britain. The average, not the minimum, the average wage in Bulgaria is a mere 400 euros per month. This means that it isn't just the last few indigenous British sellers a big issue, who will be driven out of work by Eastern European competition. The rule change that Cameron is at present set to allow in just 11 months will also unleash a flood 
of highly qualified white Eastern European skilled workers and professionals onto the British jobs market. I discussed this matter yesterday with my MEP colleague, Dimitar Stoyanov, leader of Bulgaria's National Democratic Party. He told me that he knows a senior consultant at the best hospital in Sofia, who is now having to cancel operations because three out of his four anaesthetists are now working in England. Superficially, of course, that's good for British hospitals, but in reality, it's not the case, particularly with a pell-mell drive for the NHS to buy in services from private health corporations. The arrival of a new influx of health professionals willing to accept much lower wages than their British counterparts will drive down wages. But the money saved will not be ploughed back into the health service. It will be siphoned off into the pockets of the bosses of the private companies, which with, of course, kickbacks to the Westminster insider politicians responsible for the stealth privatisation of our National Health Service. And it won't just be medical staff affected. Everyone from plumbers to architects, electricians to IT experts will find their wages pegged down even harder and their new contracts shorter and harder to come by as this new competition bites. These people will often be earning 20 times in Britain what they could for the same job in Bulgaria or Romania. As a Bulgarian patriot, Dimitar is worried because while the Asiatic gypsies and Muslim minority are reproducing rapidly, his nation's indigenous Christian birth rate has crashed. With brain drain immigration on top, it will impose terrible strains on the infrastructure of a country that already has the highest deprivation rates in Europe. The long term demographic impact could be horrific, too. So he understands entirely our position, which is, of course, to shut the door, keep them all out and use money now blown on foreign wars and bank bailouts to pay our own people a fair day's money for a fair day's work. Bulgaria has elections this summer, and at some point, I'll probably be there briefly to help the newly established NPD get publicity and the best possible result. I'll be discussing that with Mr. Stoyanov further next week. I might even see if he fancies using a message that would suit us well. Don't emigrate. Vote to make Bulgaria better. Which fits into my final point this week. As I record this, we're snowed in up in the Welsh hills, and drifting in a bit of wind makes shoveling it away impossible. Although it's in fact nothing more than a normal winter cold snap, thousands of our pensioners will die as a direct result of the combination of the weather and the fuel poverty created by privatisation price hikes, carbon taxes and an energy policy designed by crooks and Luddite cranks. Don't let any of those sad, lonely, totally preventable premature deaths happen near you. If you're fit and well, get out, knock on the doors of old folk living near you and check they're still OK. Look up the symptoms of hypothermia, how to save someone, online before you go. Even if they are well, see if they want you to make them a cup of tea and stay for a quick chat. If by chance you're getting on in years yourself and have any problems with being very cold, snowed in or whatever, feel free to call BNP head office. Our call centre staff are now on cold watch, so as a matter of fact, they might call you out of the blue anyway, if you're on our records as a pensioner or disabled member. If you do need to call, please don't hesitate. Our staff will be very happy to give you advice, do their best to arrange for someone local to call around, or just have a quick chat. Because that's the kind of unity and family spirit that our party's about, and it's what we need to make Britain better. Thank you, Nick. As erudite as ever, good luck with your travel in this weather. World News. A mother and her seven children have been jailed for 15 years in Egypt for converting back to Christianity. Nadia Muhammad Ali and her children, Mohab, Mejid, Sherif, Amira, Amir and Nancy, were sentenced at the criminal court in Beni Sif, 70 miles south of Cairo. Another seven people involved in the case were also sentenced to five years in prison, according to reports. Nadia was born a Christian, but converted to Islam when she married husband Mohammed Abdel Wahab Mustafa 23 years ago. He later died and she planned to convert back to Christianity along with her family. In 2004, after converting back to Christianity, they attempted to get new identity cards with their Christian names on them. But one of her children was arrested in 2006 and police became suspicious after looking at his documents and noticing he'd changed his name. He confessed the documents had been changed illegally 
and Nadia, her children and clerks who processed the identity cards, were all arrested and charged. The family was sentenced to 15 years in prison in court last week. Christians in Egypt who convert to Islam have complained they face difficulties if they decide to convert back, especially in changing names on official documents. This leads many people to forge the documents, risking heavy prison sentences. From the Maldives, private broadcaster Raj TV has just aired leaked security camera footage showing a group of men vandalising pre-Islamic artefacts in the National Museum of the Maldives Islands on February 7, 2012. Around 35 exhibits were destroyed when half a dozen men stormed into the museum amid the political chaos of February 7 after former President Mohamed Nasheed resigned under controversial circumstances during a police and army mutiny. The footage shows a group of men entering the museum knocking over glass cases and smashing Buddhist-era statues. Local daily Haviro reported today that it had learned the men were religious extremists who belonged to a local group. In May 2012, police forwarded cases against four suspects involved in the vandalism to the Prosecutor General's office. Police at the time declined to reveal any information regarding the identity of the four suspects and officials at the PGO were unable to confirm today if the cases had been filed at the criminal court. According to the museum director Ali Wahid, the vandals destroyed 99% of the evidence of the Maldives' pre-Islamic history prior to the 12th century, including a one-and-a-half-foot-wide representation of the Buddha's head, one of the most historically significant pieces at the museum. An official at the museum told Minervan News following the incident that the group deliberately targeted the Buddhist relics and ruins of monasteries exhibited in the pre-Islamic collection, destroying most items beyond repair. A World Date reporter comments, This shows exactly the basis of Islamist cohesion and integration. Absolutely nil. They have no respect for any other religion or culture other than Islam. Arab Spring countries face social time bomb. High youth unemployment in many post-Arab Spring countries is a social time bomb, the EU has said. On his whirlwind tour of the region, EU Council President Herman Van Rompuy stopped in Egypt and Tunisia on Tuesday. At a roundtable discussion in the Bibliotheca Alexandrina in Egypt, Rompuy said 50 million jobs would need to be created in the next couple of years for all the young people in the region about to enter a severely depressed labour market. Such a dramatic situation is a social time bomb, said Rompuy. A World Day spokesman said, well, that's what happens when people deliberately destroy their country's economy in the name of Islam. Rompuy can always make them welcome in Europe. We have loads of jobs, apparently, and endless money, and space to house these future immigrants. Talk about the EU paving the way in Europe. Two six-year-olds suspended for playing cops and robbers. Last week, two six-year-old students from White Marsh Elementary School in Maryland, USA, were hauled into the principal's office. Their crime was one for the record books. The boys had committed the unforgivable sin of pointing imaginary finger guns at each other. Since we live in a zero-tolerance world, where adults are incapable of discerning imaginary violence from the real thing, Principal Marcia Sprankle suspended the children immediately. And you read that right. They were suspended for the illegal use of finger guns. A nationalist spokesperson commented, Talk about overkill and hysteria. Better to have little boys playing with imaginary guns than big boys doing the real thing. Thought for the day. A humble try at economics. Now, no one can say that I am a financial genius. The whys and wherefores of governmental finances do not even touch base with me. I am dyslexic over actual figures. I reverse the last two numbers of digits as my bank managers over the years have had to accommodate, or not as the case would have it. But having been what is classed as a single mother, although I divorced my first husband and then was left as a widow after I divorced my second one, with all the accompanying financial dross, I can and do sympathise with people who are struggling financially with families. Been there, seen it, and got the entire wardrobe of T-shirts. So whilst not in the financial banker's hierarchy, I do know how to make a pound stretch. I also approach our country's financial predicament in a basic, no-nonsense fashion, much like our British National Party. No frills and no sentiment. And what is more important, 
no class barriers, or rather money barriers as they are now, because class has very little to do with the structure in Britain today. Now, I will try to cover the economy, the high street or lack of it, and waste. Now, sadly, just these three items tell us what shape we're in and why. Now, the economy, a huge subject, and one which many feel covers a multitude of sins. Now, I do have a lot of time for Little John in the mail, mainly because, although, like all journalists, he is paid not only for his job, but to dislike and vilify the British National Party whenever we get past the media blackout on us, but he is funny and many of his opinions are correct. And unlike our friend Peter Hitchens, his loyalties do not switch from one ethos to another. Little John has put the financial status of the cuts in simple language, and one which I can understand. He has simplified the BBC and Guardian figures, so they must be right, although the sums involved are, in reality, truly horrendous. He's taken away all the zeros and made it into a household budget, which even a thicket like me can grasp. And I quote, Annual family income, £55,060. Annual family spending, £69,489. New debt on family credit card, £11,750. Outstanding credit card balance, £131,210. Family spending cuts, £1,100. Now this means in simple terms that the repayment figures do not even come close to actually repaying our enormous debt. This means also that all the bleating, marching and strikes on these cuts are really insane. Now if we stopped foreign aid and all channels associated with it, those monies would certainly help towards a greater repayment figure, if not all of it. Certainly the large amounts of money paid out for migrants, legal aid, benefits, health care, education and you name it, because these services are not provided free of charge to anyone, would also come back into the UK pot. Large amounts of your cash spent in the name of diversity and multiculturalism redirected towards our elderly and poor would also not go amiss. This country is not in a financial position to help or provide anything at all for the large quota of Flotsam and Jetsam who land up on our doorsteps. We can kiss goodbye to the high streets of old, and it breaks my heart to say this. Although I'm a right-wing Luddite, I do appreciate the robotic age in some cases. TV, PCs, hospital equipment, mobile phones and iPods or whatever. But the effect of the web on the retail sales industry is catastrophic to say the least. All the shops that are and will be going under into receivership are single sales shops, the sort of shops I and many others grew up with and regarded as the normal method of shopping. I am including supermarkets in this as well. You went to a bookshop for books, a butcher for meat, a greengrocer for vegetables and fruit, etc. Now the double whammy of these huge multi-shopping stores, with their ease of parking and cleverly posed shelves, have literally changed the face of Britain most of all. Most supermarkets stock everything from fruit to makeup, from clothes to books, from DVDs to alcohol, and are the ruin of the face of the high street. Small businesses cannot compete with these monsters, and to hasten the end of the small personal shop, the web came into being, the cherry on a very rotten cake. We Brits are basically lazy. If we can get a takeaway meal, we will. If we can download music and films, we will. Not for us the continental way of shopping each day from the market and visiting a local library or going to see a film. Nope, not us. And thus it is we who have destroyed what was one of the best things in this country, our local and small shopkeepers. As to our manufacturing, our own greedy business personas have encouraged immigrant workers because they are cheap. Not that they work harder, but when they do work, they're happy to do so for virtually nothing. Even our minimum wage of just over £6 an hour is heaven to someone from a country that only pays a pound an hour. And of course, if they do not work, they can claim benefits as well. So the sheeples are really paying double dues and at the same time have pushed all the English manufacturing over the years to places like India or China. Because apparently it is cheaper to pay for tatty imports than employ your own people to manufacture better quality merchandise. The big thing now, apparently, is a huge girly bag that's made in China. It looks plastic and awful, and is selling for hundreds of pounds. Now, English leather used to be the best in the world, closely followed by the Spanish. Now it is Chinese plastic, and we think we've done good. 
England used to boast the best car manufacturers, leather goods, steel, fashion materials, furniture, you name it, and we made it. And we also had the best shops, Liberties, Harrods, Fortnum and Mason, and the prettiest high streets in the world. Who is to blame? Well, some people would say progress and global economy, and to some extent they would be right. We have sold our souls to the devil, in a sense, for the sake of progress and greed, and successive governments must take the blame for their inactivity and indeed encouragement of massive immigration into this country, which has and is changing the face of Britain. First, we had the small takeover of local corner shops, which suddenly stopped booze and were open all hours, and then when the smaller local shops were forced out of business by them and the ever-growing supermarkets, larger foreign-based emporiums slid in and became the norm. Larger shops like HMV and Comet moved from the high street into the new temples called Mal's, and shopping and business centres, which incorporated one of the highlights of the 80s, a pizza hut or something similar. So the poor old high street was doomed from then on in. All the small single merchandise shops either went out of business or merged, the larger shops moved out of the high street into parks and the supermarkets reigned supreme. Did you know that 80% of our children's toys are made in Asia? This is disgusting as we have our own people willing to work and the standards of these toys is usually very bad and could be dangerous. And we don't seem to care as long as we purchase as much as we can at Christmas and sob the consequences. Clean Easy, a firm that used to go house to house with marvellous brushes, etc., is now made in China, and believe me, it ain't up to scratch at all. I could go on forever on the rape of our working and shopping practices in Britain, but we can see the result with our own eyes. Somehow there must be a way to stop this rot and try to recover some of our national heritage and shopping standards. Tesco's beef burgers are but a small part of an even larger scam. Talking on beef burgers... The wastage in this country is disgusting and getting worse. And judging from the programme which covered this last night on TV, and which was excellent, the wastage is from the sheeples, not the rich. It is the man or woman in the street, and probably a large percentage of our migrant friends, who are wasting the most. Again, the supermarkets control the farmer's waste, which was the most terrible thing I've ever seen, when people in this country are going hungry and the poor farmer is trying to accommodate the supermarkets and the EU's ideas on the look of a vegetable. Who cares if a vegetable is odd-looking? It's well known that our supermarket bosses would rather import foreign goods than use our own farms. I say back to the good old days with shops that sold what they were supposed to sell, with no aisles full of two-for-one and full of crisps, soft fizzy drinks, sweets and ready meals. I'm reminded of a statement from my mother in the 60s, in that it was well known then that the rich had the emptiest dustbins and the fullest were on the local council estates, and that was years ago. So tough though it may seem, when you do see something like an old programme on TV Lad It to Lady, you have to admit they do teach the girls to plan a meal and not waste food. So we need to waste less food, try not to use the web for so much fast or cheap shopping, and generally keep a better house. Any nationalist government would immediately endeavour to bring back local industry and help small businesses. It wouldn't be easy, but the alternative looks pretty bleak. Shabby, shut-down high streets, occupied mainly by kebab houses and cheap Asian emporiums, mouths slowly closing their doors, large shopping centres likewise, supermarkets reigning supreme, with a majority of imported and suspect foods, as our farmers would be forced out of business, and everyone stuck in their houses, giving the vast foreign-run internet shops all their money. Put this with the ever-growing prospect of severe overcrowding and the picture of those people queuing for the January sales will become a normal sight for the few remaining large shops in what once was our capital city. It can be reversed and will have to be, but it will not be easy and relies on the great British public to change their habits, which of course the progressives or the New World Order don't want them to do. Up to now the sheeples have been faithfully following every move of their masters and the time has come to wake up and use the power that they have. So my thought today is we must respect money, food, our heritage and our future culture. In the words of Del Boy in Fools and Horses, come on now, you know it makes sense. And finally, feline like a stowaway, couldn't resist it. A two-year-old tabby moggy called Polly spent two days 
shuttling across the South, Wales and the West Country as the intercity service visited London, Swansea, Wiltshire and Cornwall, unfortunately not under her own steam. She'd been missing for three weeks from her home near Plymouth when she was discovered by train manager Emily Mahoney-Smith, 33, who heard her desperate mewing. It's amazing she survived for so long, said Emily. I think she climbed into the train as she was chasing rats in the shunting yard. Polly then spent the next two days trapped without food or water. She was in surprisingly good condition, although she was incredibly smelly from her infected leg. She was given a tuna fish sandwich and the RSPCA were called and then she was operated on to remove the infected leg and will be reunited with her owners, Arthur Westington, a former train driver, 84, and his wife, Louisa, 82, as soon as possible. Poor darling, that really is a case of curiosity nearly killing the cat. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain Wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend.